Good evening. Good evening. For tonight, we're going to move on to chapter 45 in our textbook, Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem. And this chapter's topic is the purity and unity of the church. And as you can see here, we're continuing in our studies on the church. I believe the next couple of chapters also deal with further topics concerning the church. We're heading towards the end. There are 57 chapters of this book, but I like to break these chapters up into different sections to spend more time, dig deeper, or read a lot of scripture, as we will tonight, on these topics. But anyway, we'll pr open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful freedom we have, God, to come together, congregate, and worship you, and learn of your word, Heavenly Father. I pray, God, that whatever comes out of my mouth, Lord, is of your spirit, not of my own beliefs, or wisdom, or attitudes, Lord, but it's purely of your spirit, and your spirit alone, Heavenly Father. Lord God, I pray you would use this message to unify us, and to teach us, Lord, what you have for the church, God. And I pray that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive and anoint my tongue to speak tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So as usual, we begin with a review of the study. And we have a sp very specific goal in studying systematic theology. It is to have methodical, systematic, and categorical study of the Bible to receive and apply God's thoughts. We make a very clear point here. We don't want to teach our own teachings or what we believe from our perce per human perspectives. We want to teach what God actually says. We want to read his word and actually study what he says, not the thoughts and opinions of man. But we also have a memory passage for this class. as Isaiah chapter 28, verses 9 to 10. I will recite it. To whom will he teach knowledge, and to whom will he explain the message? Those who are weaned from the milk, those taken from the breast, for it is precept upon precept, Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. And in studying systematic theology in this class, we want to ensure we understand what doctrine is. That's how we can truly receive and apply God's thoughts through our teachings here. Simply stated, we see doctrine as God's words and thoughts as revealed through the Bible. By teaching doctrine, we teach and learn not our words and thoughts, but God's. And we also stress teaching doctrine in a systematic manner. We do so because we want to avoid teaching non-systematic doctrine. Too many times we have a tendency as human beings to create our own doctrine through proof texting, which is where we take one or a few script, script, excuse me, one or a few scripture verses and rationally come up with our own doctrine instead of consulting the Bible as a whole. Doctrine, to truly understand doctrine, it takes time to understand the word of God as a whole rather than just taking one verse out of context. That's why we study systematic doctrine, or study script doctrine systematically, systematically to make sure we are, te we are teaching what is accurate to all of Scripture. So during our previous class, we studied the marks and purposes of the church. We first examined the marks or characteristics of a true church, noting how the correct teachings of the Scriptures is the primary and most important one, as well as how the lack of such teachings, of sound teaching, is indicative of a false church. We also noted how a true church gathers with the intent of truly worshiping God, teaching the word, and, if possible, but not required, performing baptisms and partaking of communion in a genuine, reverent manner. We then discussed the purposes of the church, dividing these into three ministries. These are our ministry to God and worship, our ministry to believers through nurturing them, and our ministry to the world through evangelism and merciful acts, such as giving to the poor. Finally, we discussed how churches must ensure these three ministries are properly balanced to avoid negate, excuse me, neglecting any of them. However, we noted that individual believers, while they should participate in all three, do not need to balance them due to how God gives different callings and abilities to each believer. These studies thoroughly demonstrate the pivotal role the church plays in the lives of believers in God's work for the world and his plans for eternity. With chapter 44 having been completed, we now turn our attention to the 45th chapter of our textbook. Similar to the last chapter, our current one continues our studies on the church, with it specifically covering its purity, in unity. This chapter can be considered a sort of continuation of our discussion on the marks of the church, 
where we specified the differences between true and false churches. However, Scripture makes a further distinction between true churches, excuse me, between the true churches, noting how there are ones that are more pure than others, and by extension, how there are ones that are less pure than others. With such a revelation, it should cause us to inquire, how is a church made more, more or less pure? What are the signs that indicate a church's level of purity? During tonight's class, we will discuss the scriptural basis for the concept of greater and lesser purity among churches. We will then provide church-specific definitions for the terms purity and unity. Finally, we will discuss the signs of a more pure church. It will be next class we will discuss in detail the unity of the church. So as we previously, previously discussed, God's word identifies the existence of true and false churches. However, even among true churches, there are those that are less pure than others. This is seen throughout the Apostle Paul's epistles. The following are the passages that discuss churches of greater purity and a general lack of major moral or doctrinal issues. For example, uh, if you want to turn your, script or your, your Bibles, um, we're going to read some fairly lengthy passages here. But I'm going to start with Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 11, if you wish to turn there. I'll give you a brief moment. Reading Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 to 11. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that, you love, that your love may abound more and more, with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus, to the glory and praise of God. We then have 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 to 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 2 to 10. We give thanks to God always for you all, for all of you, constantly remembering or mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, excuse me, for we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we are, we in the Holy Spirit, excuse me, you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Holy Spirit. For you received the word in much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind the Excuse me, the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God and from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Finally, we have 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 5. We want you to know, brothers, starting in verse 1 in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. 
Now, in contrast to these past three passages, the, the epistles Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia and Corinth showcased true churches that are plagued with many serious doctrinal and moral problems. The following are some passages that, the, that discuss them. So we have Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. These will be shorter, by the way. But I am astonished that you are so quickly desert, deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again. If anyone is preaching you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. We also have 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1-4. to but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were, you were not ready for it. And even now, you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is, je for while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another... I follow Apollos. Are you not being merely human? Finally, there's 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. It is actually reported that there is immorality among you, and of a kind that is not even tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his, fa his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Are you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. While an entire class's time could be devoted to sharing the many other passages concerning pure and impure churches, and Grudem actually gave dozens throughout the epistles, what was shared here should be sufficient to prove that purity levels differ between churches. We will now discuss the definitions of purity and unity concerning the church. Grudem defines the purity of the church as follows. The purity of the church is its degree of freedom from, the wrong, from wrong doctrine and conduct, and its degree of conformity to God's revealed will for the church. Grudem also notes that while we should pray for the church and work towards increasing its purity, this concern by, should by no means be our only one. Doing so would cause us to bring great division in the church to such a degree that we would wrongfully separate ourselves into tiny groups of very pure, quote-unquote, Christians, in addition to excluding every, anyone who showed even the slightest deviation in doctrine or conduct of life from us. It is true, we're not, it's true that most of us are never going to completely agree on everything. But it is important to stress unity in the church, which is why the New Testament does so, which Grudem defines as follows. The unity of the church is its degree of freedom from divisions among true Christians, now, the use of the term true Christian here is of the utmost importance. This is because, as we thoroughly covered in our last class, that there are many people that simply apply the name Christian to themselves but have no true saving faith whatsoever. By extension, there are many false churches that claim to be true, yet are filled to the brim with unbelievers that are cultural, quote-unquote, Christians, or Christians in name only. Because of this, we cannot reasonably expect there to be true and complete unity between all churches that use the Christian name. Rather, it is with true believers that we should work hard to achieve unity. We will now discuss the signs of a more pure church. The following are the factors that make a church more pure. There is a genuine love for Christ. A firm foundation in Bible doctrine, or in other words, the right preaching of the word. There is proper use of ordinances, namely baptism and communion. There is also the right use of church discipline, genuine worship, effective prayer, effective fellowship, biblical church government, spiritual power in ministry, personal holiness of life among members, cared for the poor, and I would add to Grudem's list, an effective witness to the lost. The signs of church purity are not limited to these, but they are factors 
that they are among, among the factors that bring churches closer to conformity with God's purposes. Furthermore, some churches may be more or less pure in some of these factors than others. For example, a church may have genuine worship and a strong witness, but it may suffer from a lacking ministry to the lost and a poor understanding of doctrine. Furthermore, some churches may come to believe that the factors in which they are strongest in are the most important, while the ones they are weaker in are less important. However, scriptures note the importance of working towards purity in all of them. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 26 to 27 say, that he, Christ, might sanctify her, the church, cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, emphasizing here, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might, excuse me, might be holy and without blemish. The Apostle Paul encourages believers in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. In addition, Titus chapter 1, verse 9 says of church elders, He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he might be able to give instruction, instruction in sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. In addition, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 to 34, call for the proper use of the sacraments, specifically communion, while 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 to 7, and verses 12 to 13, charged, charged the church to use proper discipline to protect its purity. Other fact, factors mentioned in the scriptures include spiritual worship in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, having an effective witness in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 to 20, proper church government in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 to 13, spiritual power in ministry in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, personal holiness in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, caring for the poor in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35, and having a genuine love for Christ in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8. From these verses, in addition to the many others that mention these factors, there is a strong spiritual case for the church to work towards purity in not just some, but all these factors. However, it is imperative to note that such purity does not come overnight. It is a process. This means any church we visit, even our own, will have areas where we will be impure. This, in fact, a perfectly pure church has not and never will exist until Christ, retur Christ returns and we experience the fullness of his, the fullness of his regeneration. How, because of this, believers are not required to seek the purest church they can find and leave it if they find an even purer church. Rather, what we should be concerned with is finding a true church that God leads us to, where we, where we can have effective ministry, grow in Christ, and work with fellow believers who also strive for church purity. It is through doing this that God will often bless our prayers and faithful witness by helping the church gradually grow in many areas of purity. It is also important to note that unfortunately there will be churches that will not respond well to true believers influencing them to greater purity. Such churches, despite having a few believers, are being sent in a dominant direction by others who desire to drift the church in a direction apart from sound doctrine and Christ-like behavior. Such wayward individuals can lead churches to compromise with the, the desires, practices, and beliefs of the world system, while prayer and repentance can leave room for God to graciously intervene in the church and bring about reformation. Unfortunately, such churches can become severely compromised become outright false churches, or even cease to exist. Yet others may become weakened, watered-down congregations where most hold to a weak, worldly-minded view of Bible doctrine, or have pastors that only preach on worldly, prosperity-based topics, such as how to be rich, how to be successful, and so forth. To avoid following to such horrible states, it is imperative that the church guards against teachings and attitudes that lead us to impurity. I do want to preface the last part and this part by saying that this is not meant to be an attack on any specific denomination or church or individual. This are, these are general principles that are to be watched for. This is not meant to be an attack or cause division or anything, but these are things that are very important and must be said. And these are the, excuse me, 
these are the things we should watch out for that can lead a church against the teachings and attitudes that lead to purity. For example, believers in churches that are seriously impure or are becoming impure are marked by a continual growth in man-centeredness rather than God-centeredness. When believers in whole churches do so, they begin to stray from the faithfulness to Christ, or from their faithfulness to Christ, which will cause them to increasingly adopt the world's teachings over sound Bible doctrine. This will also lead the believers in churches' lives to become man-centered in their activities, preaching, counseling, goals, and casual conversations. They will also exhibit an ever-increasing emphasis on turning to the wisdom of this world rather than God's word and prayer for counseling, counseling and help, choosing instead to pursue self-help publications, secular psychology, and worldly-minded TV stars and politicians, many of which aren't even Christians to begin with. By becoming engrossed in this worldly behavior and this wisdom from below, they begin to experience a spiritual decline settling in as extended prayers grow sparse and scripture is no longer applied to their lives or their daily situations. Instead, these churches and believers unfortunately fall to a deceptive attitude of tolerance towards sinful behaviors and lifestyles and the worldly attempt to be loving, sensitive, and affirming, rather than standing on God's word and loving the sinner but hating the sin. Scriptural context will also fall away from the preaching and fellowship in these churches, with less and less emphasis being placed on daily prayer, daily Bible reading, constant trust in Jesus, and knowing the reality of his, const his constant presence in their lives. Furthermore, an emphasis on the false teaching that man can overcome sin by his own strength, or even a tolerant view towards certain outward sins can become prevalent, Blind blinding such congregations from living in the victory Christ won over our sins. Thus, a church that exhibits these worldly teachings and behaviors is one that is becoming increasingly less pure and is heading towards becoming an outright false church. These are the behaviors and teachings that the scriptures condemn and the ones that we should actively avoid and address as true churches and believers. In this class, we discuss the purity of the church. We began by proving the scriptural basis for the existence of more and less pure churches. As the Apostle Paul's epistles prove, Certain churches can possess serious moral and doctrinal issues that severely decrease the purity, while, while these is, with these issues not being present in other churches. We then define church purity and unity. We noted how Grudem respectively defines these as the degree of freedom from wrong doctrine and conduct, and the freedom from divi divisions among true Christians. Finally, we discussed the signs of a more pure church. Here, we noted how true churches will strive for purity in all these signs, that no church prior to Christ's return will ever be perfect, and how we should abstain from secular, man-centered teachings, attitudes, and compromises that plague many of today's impure and even outright false churches. As these topics thoroughly demonstrate, purity is not only critical to a church's survival, but it is also possible through humble obedience to God's word and a stewing of worldly interpretations of it and an unswerving reliance on the Holy Spirit's power to help us overcome sin and live in obedience to Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this class tonight. I pray you keep these things in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.